clock. Okay, fantastic. So, so far uh, uh, we learn um, the basic of electrodynamics and then we start with the green function. We saw a couple of examples. And today we are following from where we stopped, which was the second case of finding green function for a specific geometry. So the geometry, uh, uh, I, I'm not doing the entire the calculation, uh, but uh, what we would like to, uh, to remind ourselves is the geometry. So we assume that we have a, a sphere. This is the perfect sphere that I have ever made in my life. And then we assume that we have a specific charge distribution around it with the charge distribution of X prime. And what we have done, we assume that uh, uh, for, in order to find the potential anywhere outside of the sphere, we need to, we need to find the green function for this geometry. So we use the technique of uh, uh, image charge, which means that we, we assume this specific charge distribution to be quantized and we solve the problem for one of them explicitly. And we assume at that specific case that this charge is located here. I think I use strange notation of I think Z zero, if I recall. Then we say that inside of the sphere we have a an image charge, which is Q prime, which is located at the distance of Z prime. Okay. And we assume also the direction which defines this charge and breaks the symmetry essentially, because you have a spherical symmetry, but as soon as you have a charge, then the symmetry is broken and is, is reduced to cylindrical symmetry. So from the spherical one, you become cylindrical. Everything around that will be symmetric. So we assume that this is the z direction, and we call it, I think, with the z hat, right? I think we call it with the z hat or n hat. I don't n know. n hat, yes. n hat. N -hat. Yeah. So let's go with n hat. And then we assume that the place that we are looking for the potential, which is located here, is given at the distance of r and that is x. So essentially, charge Q is located at z0 n hat, Q prime, which we found the value for the Q prime, which was minus, uh, uh, let me, it should be A divided by Z zero, all right, is located, located at Z prime, which Z prime was given by A squared divided by Z zero and hat, okay? That was the location. And finally, the place that we are looking for the potential X is R, R hat. And that was the question of Nazanin that uh, uh, where we have the theta. Oh. Did I break something? Oh, sorry. So where we have, uh, we have theta and phi, and we, yes, we know that, of course, the distance is fixed, but the vector that defines the space is essentially in spherical coordinate is function of uh, theta and phi hat, phi, okay? And we assume also the, this, uh, the, the angle between n hat and r hat, this angle is given by alpha. If alpha or gamma, I don't remember, I choose alpha, I think, yeah. Okay, fantastic. And 
But the entire of this, let's say, calculation was done for the case when the conductive sphere, a conducting sphere is grounded. So it's kept at the potential of zero. Okay. So far, then, uh, uh, I think uh, we can resolve the problem and we can say that the potential everywhere is given by one divided by four pi epsilon naught you to have the potential due to the charge, real charge of Q, which will be Q divided by X minus the location of the charge, which is, uh, which is Z zero N hat plus Q prime X minus X prime, which the Q prime has a negative sign which is minus A divided by Z zero of Q divided by X hat, sorry, X minus Z one, uh, sorry, Z prime N hat. And now that is the potential that we found. What is the value of the potential at radius of A on the, on the surface of the sphere? Is zero, right? So this is the way that we found the value for Q prime and the value for Z prime. Do you agree, guys? Fantastic. Okay. So um, let's do a little bit of mathematics. And I, I, I don't like to jump quickly. So let's reply, replace it here. You will get one divided by four pi epsilon naught. And then you have a Q divided by R, R hat minus Z zero, N hat minus A divided by Z zero, Q. Then R, R hat minus Z prime, which is A squared divided by Z zero, N hat. which we can write it again. We can factor out Q divided by four pi epsilon naught, and then we get one divided by R square plus Z square minus two R Z zero, R hat dot Z hat. What is R hat dot Z hat from this figure is cosine of alpha, okay? which we write it down here is cosine of alpha power of one half minus a divided by z zero. And that will be r power of two plus a squared divided by z zero power of two minus two r a squared divided by Z zero cosine of alpha again, because that will be uh, 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 R dot N hat. All right. Good, fantastic. I found the green function for this charge. How do you, do you get a green function? If you recall from the previous discussion, if you find the potential, then it is sufficient to replace the charge with four pi epsilon naught. And then what you will get, you will get the green function. And the green function, what happens with the green function at the boundary, it will be equal to zero, right? Then that's a Drischler green function that you will get, okay? So I'm formally replacing Q with four pi epsilon naught, and then I will get a green function, which is G of X and X prime. one divided by R squared plus Z zero power of two minus two R Z zero cosine of alpha power of one half minus A divided by Z zero 
R squared plus A squared plus divided by Z zero power of two minus two R A power of two Z zero cosine of alpha one half. Okay, that's the beam function. And remember, what is the value of green function at the boundary, which is x equal to a r hat, green function at a r hat and x prime, which will be equal to zero. So that's a Trishla green function. Gavin, do you have a question? Okay, perfect. Don't hesitate, please. Sorry, can I ask a question? Absolutely. Um, I don't know where this uh, replacing rule that you said comes from the Q when we put four pi epsilon naught instead of Q. I have I I asked you in the second lecture that look at this value and prove to me that the Laplacian of these should be equal to four pi delta. Okay, so if you have, I mean, this is the potential that we found, right? Now we are saying that this should be equal to the green function for specific charge distribution. Then we take the Laplacian of this and we look at the value. And if you look at the Laplacian of this, what you will get, you will get a certain value. And in order to get the green function, then Laplacian, of let's say potential above should be equal if that is a green function that should be equal to minus four pi delta of x minus x prime right then from here you will get what it should be the value of q okay and then the q will be essentially four pi epsilon naught so that means that the green function is a specific form of the potential that we like we have for look what was the definition of green function? Any function that has this property. Okay. And because this is the way that we found the, the, the function that G of X and X prime is equal to G of X prime and X. That's all, because this is the only condition that we used in, in, inside of the green term, the second green term, to find the potential. We have not used anything else. And we say that in order to exclude one of the terms on the boundaries, right? either you need to know the green function at the boundary to be equal to zero, or derivative to be known to us, then we are clarifying or we are dividing the green functions into two categories, either Drischler or Neumann, okay? So with all this, I mean, and we prove that the potential is unique, right? Either solving with Laplace equation or we prove also the field is unique, okay? So we are not really worried. As soon as we find one, then we are okay. Good? Thank you, yeah. Of course. So now you can prove this. I mean, you can take the derivative of this, okay? I mean, derivative, I mean, Laplacian of the G of X and X prime, and you will get that is equal to minus four pi, sorry, minus four pi rho, uh, delta of X and X prime. Okay. So far, so good, guys. Perfect. Hmm. Interesting. So if I have a charge at the front of a sphere, which is grounded, which is kept at the potential of zero, then that is the green function. Let's review and see, see some of the property. Now I assume that the charge distribution is given at the position of X prime, which is located in the direction of, uh, the distance is 
r prime and the vector here is r prime hat okay now what i want to do i want to generalize it to any charge distribution because already we solved it for the uh, a charge of uh, q which is located at z zero now i'm i want to extend it to any arbitrary situation okay good guys fantastic and then we want to find out what is the potential here which is uh, located as a r r hat and that's the place that we want to find the potential or point of observation and we may have a specific charge distribution here which means that x prime is changing r hat prime also is changing the orientation so that can be any places here that is changing okay the magnitude and also the orientation assuming that i have this mark at the front of the sphere so now the sphere if you watch it you will see different locations and different vectors right so the only thing that changes in the above formula is that z0 will be replaced by what r prime all right and cosine of alpha is the angle between r hat and r dot hat that's uh, so r prime hat okay so two formal replacement required it's r prime z0 will be replaced by r prime and do you remember we had r hat dot n hat which we call it cosine of alpha now we have r hat dot r prime hat which is cosine of alpha so cosine of alpha must be replaced by this value or you can call it cosine of alpha but remember that alpha is a function of theta phi and z okay and theta prime phi prime uh, sorry sorry my bad r prime theta prime and phi prime are theta and phi because we are solving in cylindrical coordinates okay so that is the location of the charge distribution which depends on the distance from the center origin and also orientation phi phi prime and also theta prime okay and as well as the same situation will happen for the k for the point of observation which you have a specific distance and then you have a phi prime and a phi and and theta okay so now do the replacement and see what we will get. So it will be G of D of X and X prime. Now that will be formally replaced by one divided by square root of R prime power of two minus two R R prime. I can write R that R prime just to follow the calculation minus Q, uh, sorry, A divided by Z0, which Z0 is not anymore there. It will be R prime, and that will be R power of two plus R, uh, A square minus R prime power of two minus two R A square divided by R prime r dot r prime okay remember r dot r prime hat this is a complicated one we will do the calculation what is this is the angle between any point on the charge distribution and the point of observation good clear good Fantastic. <laughs> I find multiply by this. It will be R prime power of two. That's fine. That will be R prime e square. That will be R prime. Okay, fantastic. Let's write it down in this way. One divided by square root of R prime power of two minus two R R prime. Uh, sorry. 
r dot r prime hat, the unit vector, minus a. Now I will bring r prime and I will multiply it by the denominator, but it goes inside of the square root. So then it will be power of two. So that will be square root of r prime power of two multiplied by the entire the value that we do have. Now let's simplify it further. So that will be one divided by square root of r2 plus r prime power of two minus two r r prime r get r prime. Okay, minus. You may say that the, I'm stupid. I'm doing this calculation. I'm repeating the line, but I want to show you something interesting. So and then look at this. It will be r power of two r prime power of two plus a square, sorry, a power of four minus two r r prime a power of two r dot r prime. All right. What do you see from this equation, guys? Can you factor it into like some sort of A and R and R prime? Uh, we can do that. I want to look at the way that R and R prime can be swapped. Hmm. What do you see? Uh, there's no difference between them? Like it would exactly, exactly. If you change the location of R and R prime, it's completely symmetric. So X of, uh, sorry, G D of X and X prime is equal to G or D of X prime and X. Whatever you do, the location of R and R prime is swapped, then it will be identical. This is one of the properties of green function. I will ask you to prove at home that if you take the Laplacian of these, of g of d and x and x prime, it's equal to minus four pi delta of x minus x prime. Okay? Remember, this is entirely correct when r prime is greater or equal to a. This is the condition that we do have. You have to be outside of the sphere. You are not allowed to look at the green function inside of the sphere because this is the, the way that we use the image charge. The image charge is inside of the sphere, right? So whatever we do, the calculation, it will be for this region. What is the condition for this region? R prime must be greater than the radius of the sphere. All right? And if you do this, then you will explicitly get this expression. You, will, you may have two delta functions, guys, but one of them always will be zero because it's dictating about inside and the other one is dictating about the outside. Okay, or talking about outside. Good. Now I found the green function. Still, we have to do a little bit of mathematics because I don't want to leave it like this at the moment because we are solving the problem for any charge distribution that you may have it close to a sphere. So let's look at, let's look at this scenario. What is happening with R and R prime? So the origin is located here, right? That might be, I don't know, X, Y, Z. Right, 
the Cartesian coordinate, but we are not solving it in the Cartesian coordinate. We are solving it in the spherical coordinate. So what does it mean that we have a sphere here? The sphere is located like this. So in this in the spherical coordinate, the location of, that we want to find the potential, which is x, or we want to calculate the phi, phi of x, is located here, which is defined by an r and a theta and a phi, a phi which is the location that we do have it. Definitely, r hat also is a function of this, which is, um, we will discuss about it, is a function of, uh, um, definitely will be theta and phi. It's only a unit vector indicating the direction. What about, the point that you have a charge distribution, which is x prime, then that is given by r prime, theta prime, and phi prime. So definitely r hat prime is a function of theta prime and phi prime. Do you agree with me, guys? How do we, do we get the r hat and r prime hat? So let's write them down. What is R in this coordinate? Is R cosine of theta z hat? Do you agree? I would do the projection here and I will get that angle to be equal to theta. Then I will get a, a R cosine of theta z hat plus R sine of theta which will be the projection in X, Y plane. That is the projection here. And then that angle will be phi. Then I have to project it on along X direction so to be cosine of phi X hat plus R sine of theta sine of phi Y hat. Right, this is a spherical coordinate, the transformation or the link between Cartesian coordinate and the spherical coordinate. Okay? If, I'm sure that you have seen that. It's R sine of theta uh, cosine of phi, R sine of theta sine of phi, and R cosine of theta in X, Y, and Z. All right? Good? Do you even need the um, R in there when you're calculating the hat? Because it's yeah, going to be this, anyway. this is not a hat. This is a tilde. I know, I know, but I mean above. When uh, sorry, I thought you were asking how do we get our hat. Exactly. So I, I, you are totally right. I want to give you. I want to show you a trick how to do the R hat or and phi hat and theta hat because we will be using them in the future. You are totally right. You are completely right again. What about R prime? Can we say that everything will be replaced by prime? Do you agree? Good, so that will be, again, R prime, sorry, sine of theta prime, cosine of phi prime, R sine of theta prime, sine of phi prime, and R cosine of theta prime. All of them there are R prime. Good. How do we do the calculation and finding what is R hat? Because we can define R hat, theta hat, and also phi hat. Anyone, any thoughts? No? Sir, can you repeat your question, Dr. Karen? So from this expression, all right, this is the expression that we have, which is linking the Cartesian coordinate and spherical coordinate. And now we want to build up the unique vector in spherical coordinate, because right now we have X, Y, and Z, right? Is X hat, Y hat, and Z hat, right? And we move to a spherical coordinate, which in the spherical coordinate, that will be R hat, that will be theta hat, and that will be phi hat. Oh, sorry. 
that will be phi hat. So I want to find out what is r hat, theta hat, and phi hat in terms of theta, phi, and r, which essentially will be, you will, end, you will see that it will be independent of r. It will be only function of theta and phi. Um, we said that r tilde is equal to r r hat, right? So if you just factor Big the way. r, we have r hat, but I have no idea about theta and phi hat. Okay. Any any other thoughts, guys? Uh, that uh, r uh, tilde can be uh, uh, like the uh, the the measure of that r r hat is r two plus sine of two theta, we calculate the measure of the vector and then divide the, every component by the, amount, the value of the vector. You have to do something else, uh, Melika. Okay. You are normalizing it, which is at the end, this is what Gavin says and Nazanin says, for R hat is working, yes. but not necessary for phi hat and theta hat. Any other thoughts, guys? Do you remember the directional derivative that I introduced to you? The derivative along n hats. So let's go and look at this. So this is true, not only for Cartesian spherical coordinate, it is true for any other coordinates, okay? Which usually you have the parameters. So here, what is happening that r, the vector that we do have, is a function of q1. Oh, uh, I don't like the q. Let's go with p. And q is the formalism that usually we use it. It's p1, p2, p3, or pn. So any parameters that you have. So essentially here in your calculation is a function of r theta and phi. So what you do in order to find a vector along one of those parameters, which I call it E1, then you will take the derivative of R with respect to the Q, oh, sorry, it's my habit, P1, then normalizing it. That's all. So let's do that. So let's do the calculation for R hat. How we do, so we will take R. What is the parameter for R? Is R. So we will take the derivative with respect to R and then we normalize it. So derivative of R vector with respect to R parameter that will be uh, sine of theta cosine of phi x hat plus sine of theta sine of phi y hat plus cosine of theta z hat, right? So what is the normalized value for this? Is one, you can do the calculation. Is that element power of two? That element power of two, that element power of two. Sine of theta power of two can be factored out. Then it will end up with cosine phi power of two plus sine phi power of two, which is equal to one. And then you will end up with sine theta power of two plus cosine of theta power of two, which is one. Then entirely the r hat will be sine of theta cosine of phi x hat plus sine of theta sine of phi y hat plus cosine of theta z hat. What about theta hat, guys? You have to take r, derivative of r vector with respect to theta and then normalizing it. Okay, let's do that. Take the derivative with respect to theta of r, the derivative with respect to theta of r, uh, theta, uh, th uh, yeah. That will be equal to uh, derivative of sine will be cosine. So that will be r cosine of theta cosine of phi uh, x hat plus minus, uh, sorry, plus 
of r cosine of theta sine of phi y hat minus r sine of theta z hat. What is the magnitude of this vector? So that will be cosine power of two, that will be sine cosine, that will be one, and that will be one, it will be r. You agree? So that will be equal to cosine of theta, cosine of phi, x hat plus cosine of theta, sine of phi, y hat minus sine of theta, z hat. Ah, that's interesting, right? <laughs> what about phi hat? Phi hat is interesting. You take the derivative of this with respect to phi, then let's do the calculation, derivative of r with respect to phi, and derivative of r with respect to phi, that's the first term will be minus r sine of theta, sine of phi, x hat. The second term will be plus uh, r sine of theta, cosine of phi, y hat. And the second term will be zero because it's the only function of theta. So what is happening with the magnitude of this? That will be equal to r sine of theta. So phi hat essentially will be equal to minus sine of phi x hat plus cosine of phi y hat. Okay. Good. I, I, I honestly speaking, guys, I needed only R hat. So, I, I, who knows? Maybe for the future we need something, something uh, from phi hat and theta hat. Explicitly, when we want to, uh, we want to ex express the delta delta Dirac function. In uh, you will see it later on. Okay. So. I'm looking at still, guys, I'm looking at this expression. This is the expression that we were looking at it. Right? And we want to explicitly write down this term, r dot r prime hat. Okay. I don't memorize this. I may need your help for uh, for calling uh, this equation, but let's do the calculation to find out r that r hat. So based on the calculation that we have done, this is r hat. The same scenario happens for r prime as well. So r hat dot r prime hat is equal to the product of the two. So it will be exactly the same way, just only you do have theta prime and phi prime, and then you have to do a one by one multiplication and then summing them up. So you will have sine of theta, cosine of phi, sine of theta prime, cosine of phi prime, plus sine of theta, sine of phi, sine of theta prime, sine of phi prime, plus cosine of theta, cosine of theta prime. All right, so we can factor out the sine of theta and sine of theta prime from the first term. Then we will get something like that. So it will be sine of theta, sine of theta prime. Then I will get cosine of phi, cosine of phi prime plus sine of theta prime, sorry, sorry, my bad. Sine of phi, sine of theta, phi prime plus cosine of theta, cosine of phi theta prime. This term can be simplified further. So you will get sine of theta, sine of theta prime. And that is nothing more than cosine of phi minus phi prime. 
plus cosine of theta cosine of theta prime. Oh, okay. All right. So the green function now of x and x prime, remember x is r, r hat, and what, uh, x prime is r prime, r hat prime, is given by one divided by r power of two plus r prime power of two minus two r r prime, cosine of this, which I will call it, I don't know, or r dot r prime, r one half, minus, I had an a in the denominator. In the denominator, I had r power of two, r prime power of two, plus a four minus two r r prime, a power of two r dot r prime. Is that good? Is correct based on what we have written? If it's true, then I have a really good visual memory. <laughs> Let me check. So our, our prime power of two, that second term is usually important. Let's look at these. Our, our prime power of two, a four minus two, a, oh, okay, a four. I think the, yes, that's correct. And then I know that r dot r prime hat is equal to sine of theta, sine of theta prime, cosine of phi minus phi prime plus cosine of theta, cosine of theta prime. Beautiful. So that is really the G of X and X prime depends on R, R prime, theta prime, phi prime, theta, phi, and the boundary, which is A, okay? So this is exactly what we were looking for. As soon as I have this, then I can place any charge distribution at the front of the sphere and I will get the result. Good? Let's talk about the physics. So I do have the green function now. So as soon as I have the green functions and the potential is known at the boundary, then, and this is the Dirichlet boundary condition. So potential for this sphere, which we do have. So remember, this is the sphere. This is the place of, I don't know, X prime, which you have the charge distribution. And it's the place that you want to find the charge, uh, the, the potential, which is, uh, and the sphere is, maybe is kept at the potential of V zero or V in general, okay? I'm, I'm not considering that is zero. The zero is necessary for the Dirichlet green function. It's not necessary for, uh, for finding the potential. For the Dirichlet, the potential should be known at the boundary. But here we found the green function that it should be equal to zero. So the potential at uh, any places there, will be equal to integral of one divided by four pi epsilon naught, integral of rho of x prime, g d of x and x prime, d three of x prime, minus, I think that was minus, check it out guys. One divided by four pi, and that's on the volume of the entire the space and the, the other side is only on the boundary, which is only on the surface of the sphere and infinity, which is essentially, we assume that it's zero there. Uh, then 
we need to know the potential, which is phi of x prime. And then we need to know the derivative of green function normal to the surface or normal to the boundary. Good. I'm not sure about the minus or plus sign. Just guys, uh, would you please kindly check it out? Uh, that's a minus sign. It's a minus sign. Perfect. So, and remember, what is the green function? We already solved. This is the form of, sorry. This is the form of the green function that we formed. All right. Melika is, is scratching the head and say, oh my God, that, that, who is going to do this sort of calculation? It's so annoying. No, it's fine. It's fine, okay, good. So the problem that we are solving, I don't have any soccer ball at home. I do have actually, but not in this room. I don't have my stress ball as well, which is in my office. Assuming that this is a sphere, right? And we want to find the potential here. All right. And this is the charge distribution close to this. This sounds very complicated to you, right? But what you can do, you can rotate your coordinates such a way that the z axis is the point of observation. All right. So, for example, if you look at that image, I can rotate the coordinates such a way that this point of observation is along z. Okay. And that is, let's say, x, and that is y, right? Then, what is the point of observation location? Theta is equal to 0. Phi is equal to 0. And what is r is equal to z. So the entire those, let's say, complicated calculation can be simplified by just rotating your head and rotating your coordinate. So don't worry about those complicated, but we are writing it in a very general formalism. And later on, for explicit problem, we will go slowly uh, identifying those parameters. OK? And second note, this is the Dirichlet only condition, right? And we found the explicit expression for it, which is this one. What is the potential at the surface? It can be any value, any functions, essentially. Can be function of theta and phi as well. All right? That can be like that. And we don't even charge distribution. So we solve this for zero for bounding conditions, which the, the green function at the boundary is zero, which is the Trishla, but knowing the potential at the surface and knowing the potential at the surface doesn't mean that the potential is constant, but the potential can be a function of, can be a function of X prime. So essentially it can be any function that you may have it there which essential for this boundary condition that we do have can be a function of theta prime and phi prime. All right? So pay attention to these specific cases. Now let's go back to our original problem because I know that Gavin always loves to, to have the physical meaning for, for scenarios that we start with. And let's go with our situation that we had. What we solved, guys, we assume that the sphere is grounded. And the sphere is located, um, and a point charge is located at the distance of Z0 or R0, let's call it for simplicity. And what is the potential in any places of R, which is X? And the angle between these two is alpha. You can do the calculation rho, uh, which is rho of x prime, that will be given by, by charge and uh, delta of x prime minus 
uh, R0 are, let's say, N vector N hats. You can replace it here. And then you can do the entire the calculation, just replacing inside of these and the potential at the surface is zero, then that term on the boundary will be canceling out. And then you have the green function and essentially what you will end up, it will be phi of X will be equal to one divided by four pi epsilon naught or Q divided by epsilon naught. And then you have the green function indeed, which the green function is one divided by uh, square root of r2 plus r0 power of 2 minus 2r r0 cosine of alpha minus a divided by r power of 2 uh, r0 power of 2 minus c plus a power of 4 minus 2r r0 a power of 2 cosine of alpha power of 1 half. Oh, sorry. Okay, so that's the potential, the deform. Can I assume that these along the z direction? I can do that, right? So theta prime is equal to zero. Phi prime is also equal to zero. What about the other one that will be any theta and phi? So, and then cosine of alpha, which is equal to r dot r prime hat. So is equal to sine of theta, sine of theta zero, or theta prime, which is zero, that then term, that term will be zero. And then I have a cosine of uh, theta, cosine of theta prime, which theta prime is equal to, to zero, then it will be cosine of theta. So the only matter now is the angle from, from, uh, from the z-axis, okay? So then the potential that I do have, if I want to show it in the, spher in the spherical coordinate, this is look like, if I watch the system, essentially the system is rotated. Now that's the point charge that I have. That's a Z axis. This distance is about R zero. The point charge is located here. This is the Cartesian coordinate of X and Y. And then this is the point of observation. And we know that the angle between these two is theta. And that's the reason that we have written that way. So then phi of X is equal to Q divided by four pi epsilon zero. And then that will be one divided by r squared plus r0 power of 2 minus 2r r0 cosine of theta power of 1 half minus a divided by r2 r0 power of 2 plus a power of 4 minus 2r r0 a squared cosine of theta power of 1 half. All right. So we found the potential, what we can get. And by the way, remember, the sphere is at potential at the, at the potential of zero, okay? Good. What is our goal? Finding electric field. What is the electric field? Minus gradient of phi. In which coordinate should we write the gradient? Okay. Up to you, right? Q. 
Should we do spherical then? Let's go with spherical. If you want to write it in a Cartesian coordinate, guys, be careful. Because if you write it in a Cartesian coordinate, you have to transfer R into, let's say, X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared. And you have to write cosine of theta in terms of the X, Y, and Z, okay? So be careful of that. So let's write it in spherical coordinate. So what does it mean? That it will, it will be minus R hat derivative with respect to R. All right, plus theta hat derivative with respect to theta. All right, and phi hat, which will be our sine of theta with respect to phi. Do you agree? All right, perfect. So uh, let me let me just quickly look at the, the, the uh, yes, that will be, if you move it in this direction, it will be R sine of T phi, yes, that will be H3. H2 will be that angle, which will be R, and H1 will be equal to one. Okay, that's perfect, yes, that's fine. It's not function of phi, so the potential is not function of phi, then it's zero, so that term is definitely zero which is very trivial. So the, the entire the system along Z axis has symmetry. So then is not function of phi, the electric field. It's only function of the location, which is rho or R and theta, which is the angle that you have it between uh, Z axis and the point of observation. So then let's take the derivative. So the first term that we have to do is derivative with respect to R of the potential, which will be two terms. Uh, and that will be, we've got Q divided by four pi epsilon zero, and then it will be minus one half. And the second term will be derivative of rho, that will be two R, that will be zero. The second term will be minus two R zero cosine of, Theta, do you agree? And then whatever we have in denominator, power of t divided by two with a negative sign. All right, good. Correct me if I'm doing a mistake because uh, I have not done this so far. So it will be that will be uh, that one is a tricky part. So is a two r r zero power of two a four will be zero and there will be a minus one half as well. Oh, let me do, redo it. So it will be minus one half. Then we do have two R, R zero power of two, minus two R zero, a power of two, cosine of theta. Whatever we do have in the denominator will be power of three divided by two with a negative sign. All right. Let's simplify this. That will be one half, one half goes away. That goes away as well. Then it will be positive sign. That will be Q divided by four pi epsilon naught. And then we do have R minus R zero cosine of theta, which is beautiful, by the way. You will see it in a couple of lectures from now. Plus R zero power of two minus two R R zero cosine of theta R of T divided by two. I think there is a negative sign as well is needed. And then we do have plus A times R R zero power of two minus two R R zero A power of two cosine of theta. divided by r power of two plus r zero power of two minus two r r zero cosine of theta. Uh, so, uh, shoot, sorry, sorry. That will be r two r zero power of two plus a power of four minus two r r zero a power of two cosine of theta power of three divided by two. Good. 
Sorry, I, I might I forgot. What is A again? Is the radius of the sphere. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, right. It depends on the geometry as well. So, and then let's take the derivative with respect to theta as well. Derivative with respect to theta of phi, because we want to also know what is happening. Uh, although it's not useful for me at this stage, but you can do as an exercise. Let's do it together. It will be a q divided by four pi epsilon naught. Then derivative with respect to theta that will be uh, one half minus one half, and then that will be minus two r r zero. Uh, derivative of cosine will be minus sine, and it will be plus sine of theta. And whatever we have in denominator will be power of two half minus a minus one half. And then taking the derivative of that one will be again minus sine, it will be plus sine, it will be two r r zero, a power of two sine of theta, okay? And then we do have whatever in the denominator power of two half. So you can simplify further and you will get Q divided by four pi epsilon naught. Uh, so it will be uh, one half goes away. That will be minus R R zero sine of theta divided by R square plus R zero power of two minus two R R zero cosine of theta power of two half. And my, uh, that will be plus sine two R R, sorry, R R zero, a power of three sine of theta divided by R R zero power of two plus a power of four minus two R R zero, a power of four, two cosine of theta, power of three divided by two. Okay, essentially someone can take away R R zero sine of theta outside, then uh, you can factor it out and then you will get some nice expression actually. And then you have to divide it by R as well. The R goes away and then it will be only function of R zero sine of theta as a dominator, as a denominator, and dominator is there. Good. I did it just an exercise. I'm mean, usually, I do it once just to give you the feeling how to do the mathematics and later on, I will leave it to you. Good, so electric field is clear, is clear now. Question, what is the charge distribution at the surface? So you have the sphere, you put the point charge here, and then you will see that there is an electric field everywhere here. Now I'm asking you, what is the surface charge? Can we use the boundary condition like as we did before? Exactly, so let's do that. So boundary condition tells us that here the electric field is zero. Here the electric field exists. This is what we found it, which is minus gradient of phi. And what is normal to the surface? It is R hat. So then we know that E2 minus E1 dot normal to the surface, which is R hat, is equal to sigma divided by epsilon naught. What is E1 is zero. So sigma divided by epsilon naught is equal to E2 dot R. What is E2 dot R? Is the R component of the electric field outside, which we have already calculated. Okay. So then here we know that sigma is equal to epsilon zero, uh, E2N or E2, oh, let's see. E outside dot r hat, which is equal to epsilon zero. And we already did the calculation that is minus 
derivative with respect to r of phi. So that is equal to minus epsilon zero of q divided by four pi epsilon naught minus r minus r zero sine of theta divided by there is a tricky part. Hopefully you will remember. Cosine of theta, power of t divided by two. Where, where this should happen? Mel Melika? Like or, where uh, this should happen? You mean like on the surface we are talking about? Which means? Uh, at R equals. To A. All right, Tarek? Perfect. So now I'll replace it here and you will see something interesting. So that will be minus Q divided by four pi. Then uh, that will be minus A minus R zero sine of theta. Then, um, I think this sign should be also cosine. All right, that's completely correct. Agreed, 100%. Cosine, cosine. Then it will be R squared. Uh, I don't like uh, iPad because it's it's very different when you write it on a board because you can see the equations easily and now you have to bring it up down <laughs> plus r0 minus 2 a r0 please check it out guys uh, hopefully I'm not doing any mistake plus a a r0 power of 2 minus r0 a power of 2 cosine of theta then that will be a power of 2 r0 power of 2 plus a power of 4 minus 2 r a oh gosh that will be minus 2 r0 a power of t cosine of theta Okay. I uh, will take away R0, power of two outside. Now that doesn't solve R0. I cannot simplify further. I mean, the denominator definitely simplify. One A goes away. Uh, but I cannot simplify further. But anyway, that's sigma at the surface, which is function of theta only. All right. If you look at the sigma, you will see that only that depends on the theta, nothing more. What is the total charge on, this, on the surface of the sphere? So the total charge on the surface of the sphere. So sigma, if you do the integration on the surface, d2 of x prime or x whatever you do consider that will be integral on the surface of this sphere 
that will be integral uh, from, you can write it in a Cartesian code in spherical coordinate that will be zero to two pi of d phi, zero to pi of d uh, theta, sine of theta, because the surface is given by this value, okay? And then what else do you have? Uh, okay, let me, let me look at this. So volume. Okay, so these two will be R square, D theta, D phi, sine of theta. So there will be an A square on the surface. And then that will be sigma. So you have to do the calculation of this. So it's integration on D phi, which will be independent of phi, that will give you two pi. And then you have, uh, integral from zero to two pi of d theta sine of theta, which essentially, since everything is a function of cosine of theta, you can write that one as a two pi a square integral from zero to one of d cosine of theta, okay? Of sigma of theta, which you do have it. So if you write it in this form, you will get uh, the, the integral to be completed. And then what you will get, you will get minus A divided by uh, R0 Q. A is the total of the image charge, which we expected. All right. You can also calculate what is the force between these two. And the force essentially will be between two point charges. And that will be one divided by four pi epsilon naught. What is the value of the charge? First one Q, the second one minus Q, minus, sorry, minus A divided by R zero Q divided by the distance between the two. So the first one is R zero, and the location of the other one is given by uh, R1, right? So then that will be equal to R minus R0, absolute value, power of two. It will be one divided by four pi epsilon zero. And that is one. Then it will be Q minus A divided by R0 Q. And that will be equal to uh, the distance between the two charges, which is uh, the first one is uh, R0. The second one was A square divided by R0. R2. Okay. Also, you can look at the cases when uh, the distance R0 is really far. So compared to, compared to A and other scenarios, and you can compare them together. So, so far, uh, I think uh, we do have a clear picture on what is happening with a point charge close to a sphere, which is grounded. Then uh, we can go with other scenarios. When we have a charge distribution, when we, the, the sphere is not grounded, or uh, uh, the sphere is kept at a certain potential, or when the surface uh, uh, has a specific, let's say, potential distribution. We can solve all of those cases together. So do you have any questions so far or uh, we can have a stop? Clear? Fantastic. So we will have about 15 minutes of stop and then we will see each other at 4.05. Thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, now let's come back to the to 
a few of the discussions that we had. So, so far we found the green function and the green function for this geometry explicitly that we talk uh, about. So that was a sphere and then uh, uh, we had a specific charge distribution and uh, that was the location for them, which was X prime and that was X. And then we find the explicit expression for the green function for a, put, uh, for a sphere, which is grounded and the radius of the sphere was A. So, and GD was, was, gosh, uh, GD was one divided by R square plus R prime power of two minus two R R prime cosine of alpha, which alpha was the angle between the two. And then uh, power of one half minus a divided by R prime. Then we had, uh, we had, uh, we had, gosh, I don't remember uh, what was the value. Anyone remembers this or we have to look at the notes? R squared, R prime squared. R prime square? Yeah. Okay. And then plus A to the four. A to the four. Ah, that's a little bit tricky. Look at the green function. Let me look at the green function. That was the green function essentially. A divided by R. Okay. Now let me remember R, R prime power of two plus A four minus two R R prime A square R that R. Okay. Okay. Good, excellent. Also, isn't cosine alpha just cosine theta now? Uh, no, because we assume a specific charge distribution here. Oops, what happened? So it's explicitly a charge distribution here, so not necessarily is theta. That was happening when we had the explicit, let's say, point charges. Now is this charge distribution, then any of them, they have a specific angle, not necessarily all of them, they are along, let's say, Zen direction. So they are around it, okay? So that will be um, the relationship, which will be A divided by R power of two, R prime power of two plus A power of four minus two R R prime, A power of two cosine of alpha, and then, that was the green function that we had. Green function. Next one. Next one. And that green function satisfies the boundary condition, which is at the at zero, essentially. Uh, the problem now, and remember again, cosine of alpha. If I remember well. That was sine of theta, sine of theta prime, cosine of phi minus phi prime, plus cosine of theta, cosine of theta prime. Remember now is a distribution essentially that we have to look for. So then we can find any, any uh, uh, for this specific boundary condition essentially, uh, we can find the potential, which is potential of x is given by one divided by four pi epsilon naught integral of rho of x prime, g of d of x and x prime, and then d3 of x prime, which is all space that we are considering, minus one divided by four pi integral on a surface of, 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 of a potential x prime, g d of x and x prime d two of x prime shouldn't that be oh yeah yeah that will be the derivative along uh, vector of n okay 
Fantastic. So, so far we are okay because we are looking for the digital body condition and we found that and then we can solve the problem for any specific case. As I said previously, and we solve also that for the other case, when we assume that the plane or the, the, the let's say, infinite dimension plane has a specific charge distribution, that applies also here as well. And we can solve the problem for any specific charge distribution, including when the charge distribution is zero. So for example, we assume a specific problem, which now the sphere is kept at a specific potential. And there is no charge distribution. Rho x prime is zero. So there is no charge around it. So this sphere is kept at specific potential function. So including what, I don't know, for people which we will, we will be solving it, for example, spherical harmonics, it can be kept at the specific harmonics charge distribution. Okay, or let's say, I don't know, we assume that here on the north, north hemisphere here is positive charge and the positive potential and lower hemisphere is negative charge of V0. Can I do that, right? So I assume that now there is no charge distribution around it, but here, the sphere is kept at a specific potential. And what is the specific potential? Northern hemisphere has a pot positive potential. Southern hem hemisphere has a negative potential. OK? Or I can give the potential at the surface, phi at x at the surface of this sphere is given by cosine of theta. And that is the potential that they have. V0 cosine of theta. What, which means that at the equator, there is no charge distribution, but at the north sphere is positive, uh, sorry, at the equator, there is no potential. At the north pole, it is a positive potential of V0, and the source one is, yes, that's true. At the source one is negative V0. Is it clear? Is that clear, guys? This is the potential distribution that I'm giving it. Maybe along phi, also I will give another distribution. That's the first scenario. So the first scenario case was this. So when theta is greater than pi divided by two of, let's say, when theta is between zero and pi divided by two, that is V zero. And when theta is greater than pi over two and lower than pi, that is minus V zero. That's the first scenario. Second scenario, I assume that V uh, potential at the surface is a function of theta only, which is given by V0 cosine of theta. And now I can even give you a very complicated scenario, which three, which third one, V theta and phi is not function of R anymore because it's at the surface, is a, a fixed radius that is given by V0 cosine of theta and sine of two phi. Which means that as a neutral, if you rotate it, then also the potential is changing. Okay? Is that clear? It's it's complicated scenario. And uh, all of those complicated scenarios, or even more complicated than this, can be solved with the uh, with the boundary condition problem that we already solved. So in all of those three scenarios, so three problems that we do have, there is no explicit charge distribution. So there is no role of X prime. So we assume that the first term is zero in the green function. So that term doesn't exist. The only term that exists is the second term, which is what is happening with the potential at the surface 
And then in order to find out the potential everywhere, you need to look for the normal of the green function. Where? At the surface. Do you have the potential of the green function? Sorry, do you have the green function? Yeah, I do have it because we already did the calculation and that was the green function. All right, which is because the potential is defined at the boundary is digital boundary condition. That's the digital green function. What we have to do, we have to find minus one divided by four pi integral of the potential which is given at the boundary. And now we have to take the normal of the, the normal derivative of the green function of x prime, the two of x prime. And what is the normal to the surface? Is along r direction or r hat direction, which we already did the mathematics. So it will be derivative with respect to r prime of g of x and x prime. Did we do the calculation already? Yes, we have already done the calculation and that was well, what we found it here, we're at the boundary, at the boundary. Because this is where it is evaluated. All right, so let's do the mathematics, then you will get minus one divided by four pi, and then integral of uh, on the surface, which we'll, we will spell it out, we will write it explicitly, that will be phi of x prime, then what is the green function derivative it, at the boundary? It is um, r square, r zero power of two minus a power of two. Uh, r zero power of two, well, let's write it. If I'm not mistaken, that was what we had it. La, 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 a, I, that is true. Excellent. Good. Remember, what is cosine of alpha? So complicated. Okay. If you fix uh, uh, the situation, then you, you, can, you can expand it in a specific way, okay? So what is D3, uh, D2 of X prime, which is on the surface, as we wrote an element on the surface will be D uh, um, theta prime, sine of theta prime, D phi prime, or essentially people, they write it integral of uh, D phi prime in, from zero to two pi, integral of zero to one of d of cosine of theta. Okay. This is what people usually will write it down on the surface. And the entire of that will be multiplied by a squared because we need that is, is minus a squared divided by four pi. It will be an a outside of this integral on the surface, which will be zero to two pi of d Phi prime integral of zero to one of d of cosine of theta, then um, prime, then that will be r prime, uh, r power of two, sorry, minus a power of two. And that will be r power of two plus a power of two minus two r a cosine of theta. Keep on. Um, sorry, that is the sign of alpha. Okay, remember that was the green function. We set the r zero to be equal to uh, r prime to be equal to a, and that was the reason. Okay. 
And then we have the potential, which the potential is given at theta prime and phi prime. All right. If potential is depending on phi prime, then you have to do the integration. If it's not, then it's symmetric. Then the, the situation will be way easier to be handled. It's independent of phi prime. Okay. And remember that cosine of alpha. Also, you have to place the explicit expression. So, uh, uh, as an exercise at home, consider one of those cases and try to solve it. Consider, for example, the first scenario and second scenario and try to solve the problem and find out what is going on with potential everywhere and also the electric field everywhere in the space. All right. Good. Now let's look at another problem. So now we assume something else. We assume that we have the sphere, but the sphere has a charge, the charge of Q is not grounded. The previous cases, we assumed that is grounded or kept at a specific potential. And now I'm assuming that the sphere is not grounded, is not attached to the ground, but has a specific charge distribution of Q. Okay? Find out the green function for this geometry. How do we solve? We assume that the charge is here, which is Q. The distance between these two is given by Z0 again, and that's a direction which is N. And we want to find the potential again anywhere here at X, which is phi of X. Good. And without the charge, if that was grounded, grounded the, the sphere was grounded, then we assume that there is a charge here, which the charge is minus A divided by Z0, Q, which is located at the location of A squared divided by Z0, that distance. Do you agree? That was the case without the sphere, without having the sphere to have uh, to carry a specific charge. And now we assume that this is the value. Do you remember that when we had a grounded sphere and we had the charge close to it? We did the calculation and we assumed that, that there will be a specific charge distribution at the surface of the sphere, which depending on the theta, what was the total value for the charge distribution? Was exactly identical to the charge of the image charge, right? It was identical to this value that we, we discussed. So integral of sigma d, let's say, on the solid angle will give you that value. So here, what is happening, the entire sphere is kept at the, with, with a charge of Q. Of course, without having that image charge or the charge distribution that is uniformly distributed on the surface. So the charge distribution uh, by, on the surface will be Q divided by four pi uh, A squared that is uniformly distributed. However, whenever you bring the charge from infinity to close to the, to the sphere, the charge distribution will change there. That still the total number of the charges is Q. Okay? So previously we assumed that it's grounded. So, uh, and if you do the mathematics, you will see that the, in, an image charge will appear here. In the second scenario, 
since there is a continuity of the charge, logically, we are expecting to have another charge at the center, which this charge is Q plus that value, A divided by Z zero Q. Such a way the entire the charges that is inside of the sphere is equal to Q. So the value of negative charge, which is minus A divided by Z zero Q appears due to the image charge, due to the charges, the charge that you place it there. However, the entire the sphere charge is Q. So we are expecting the continuity of the charges. Then we have to add another charge here which is A divided by Z zero Q to, to satisfy the continuity of the charge. With this way, we will satisfy the boundary condition. And let's look, do the mathematics. Now, so far we have two charges. Two, they are look like image charges. One is due to the charge of the Q, which is inside at location of A squared divided by Z zero. And the other one is Q plus A divided by Z zero Q, which is at the origin just to satisfy the boundary condition in such a way that the, the charge distribution without the Q small is equal to Q, okay? Now we have the potential, we have four or uh, three elements. One is Q divided by four pi epsilon zero, uh, one divided by R, R hat minus Z zero N hat, the other one is minus Q uh, A divided by Z zero divided by four pi epsilon naught, then one divided by R, R hat minus Z zero, which is, uh, sorry, Z one, which is A squared divided by Z zero N hat power of, okay. And finally, the third charge, which is Q, plus Q, uh, sorry, A divided by Z zero Q divided by four pi epsilon naught one divided by R. Remember, this part is coming from the fact that the sphere has a charge of Q and the other element here is coming from the charge continuity. Okay, so as soon as you place Q equal to four pi divided by epsilon naught, then you will get the green function. For this case, you can check it out. I mean, uh, that satisfy the boundary condition. So G of D of X and X prime will be equal to uh, one divided by R, R hat minus Z zero N hat plus, sorry, minus A divided by Z zero Q. So it goes away. Thank you. A square divided by Z zero or N hat. And then finally, plus Q divided by four pi epsilon naught. plus A divided by Z zero divided by R. Okay. 
All right. That is what you will get from from uh, from the email charge. I'll put your question mark just close to the D and checking out for me. Okay. Okay, so that was another exception, and there was another example. Now with these two, you can do many interesting, uh, let's say, mathematical problem or physical problem. So now assuming that you have a dipole, guys, so the dipole is located in this direction, a dipole moment. All right. So is a negative and positive. And now what it will happen you have another dipole inside. Solve the problem, I will solve. So if you have two charges at the distance of D, with D is small, then you look at the, the, the dipole moment inside of the, uh, inside of the sphere and finding the boundary condition. That also is, is important. Assuming the sphere is kept at the potential of zero. Or another problem. I love these sort of problems. So I have an infinitely large metal which has a bump, which is a circle, half circle, and then it goes to be infinity. So the radius of this is A. Now I, and that is kept at the potential of zero. Now I have a charge which is exactly here for simplicity at Q, which the distance from the center of, uh, of uh, let's say the pump or half sphere is look like let's say uh, z zero and find out the, uh, the the potential everywhere. Is it clear? Is I, I have a metal which is infinitely large, but I have a, a half sphere attached to it, and I'm asking you to find out the the boundary condition and let's say the green function for this problem. So you need two charges or three charges essentially to see the problem, to solve the problem, okay? Or I can give you another problem, the third one, assuming the charge, now the region of interest is inside it, inside the sphere. So I will place a charge at the distance of Z zero inside of this. And the entire the sphere is kept at the potential of zero. Now I am asking you, what is the potential everywhere inside of the sphere? Is it clear? Now I'm going inside. Let me give you another problem as well. I, lo <laughs> I love puzzles. So assuming that I have two infinitely large metal and metallic plate, and the angle between these two is 60 degrees, 
which means is pi divided by three. Both of them are kept at zero potential. Okay. I place a charge exactly here at Q. And the distance is, let's say, I don't know, um, R0. And the angle here is about, let's say, I don't know, 30 degrees. Find out the green function everywhere here. For this region. For that one, again, I needed the green function everywhere here. Here, I need the green function everywhere here. So those are the problems that you may face. I mean, I do it as an exercise for yourself. The, the latter one here, this one, I will say, solve it with the Laplace equation. By the way, I will solve it with the Laplace equation uh, and uh, with separation of variables for the next lecture, next three lectures or next two lectures. Good. Any questions so far? I bombard you with a lot of puzzles, right? <laughs> Enjoy. They're they're easy. They're not. They require a little bit of attention and finding out. What is the starting point? As soon as you know the starting point, you are done. All right. Um, will, will, will we go back to the question mark that you put? Like, how, how are we sure that when we have the charge distribution on the sphere, we also know, know the potential on the sphere so, so that we can say uh, the boundary condition is Dirichlet boundary condition? I put a question mark for you, tell me next time. Right? Thank you. Of course. <laughs> Good. Uh, any other guys? Ah, top. You're okay, Edith? Uh, sorry, Dr. Kay. Uh, uh, I don't quite understand uh, what happened to that uh, Q divided by four pi epsilon zero because uh, you sort of factor a uh, small Q true, correct? Yeah, then... the, same, the same situation. When you want to find the green function, you replace rho by, uh, by four pi epsilon naught. Yes. So essentially, what is happening from the potential, from the potential to the green function? Yes, uh, you, you have you have taken out uh, q divided by four pi epsilon zero, correct? This, this is what I have done. Uh -huh. Okay. Always I do that. Okay. With the same situation because. If you take the Laplacian, the Laplacian should give you four pi minus four pi delta of x minus x prime. The same ex question that the Nazanin asked uh, yes. in the first solve. So it, it, the same, this is the reason that I have done that. Okay. Okay? Uh, Good? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Of course, of course. Um. I, I also have a question. Please um, go ahead. Yeah. So just staying with that case, um, the way I understand it is that you have your sphere and you have an arbitrarily charged Q spread around the surface of the sphere. And when you bring a charged Q from infinity to some to a distant Z naught close to the sphere, there mm -hmm. is an image charge of A over Z naught minus a over z naught q that appears like at a distance of a squared over z naught. And in order to compens to preserve the continuity of charges on the sphere, you have 
you need to have like a charge Q plus A over Z naught Q within the sphere itself. Um, at the origin. Why does it have to be at the origin is my question. Be because you, you don't want to affect the boundary condition. If you move it up inside, right? Any places that you do, it affects the boundary condition. Okay. Okay. We don't know right. what is happening. We do the Q charge. Okay. So if you place the charge of Q small, then the image charge appears there such a way that the surface of the sphere is kept at the potential of zero. Right? Mm -hmm. This is what happens. So now you know very well that if you want to put any charges anywhere without affecting that potential, it should be at the origin. If you put it upside down or left, right, any, any way, not at the origin, then that shape of the sphere, which is given for the potential, will be distorted. And we don't want to have this happening. So the only location that you are allowed to do is at the origin. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Clear? Does that also give the answer to my question that since we are putting the charge in, in at the origin, so we still have the potential on the on the sphere, like as a given, like a, a zero probably. That's why we go with the boundary condition. I will leave it to you. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> you want to get the answer out of me? No, I, I, will, I won't answer you this time. Think about this and, and let's discuss that next meeting, okay? It's, it's important. See what is the rule of this. That's, that's the point that I'm, I'm, I'm asking for. The rest is very clear because we already discussed about it. What is this function that I'm adding? What is the rule of this function that I'm adding? Okay. It may have no rule, role, sorry, but uh, let's see. Okay. And by the way, try to solve this problem, at least the physics, just understanding. No, don't do deep mathematics of those questions, those four questions, uh, plus the other one. Just look at the how to solve these kind of problems. Don't get shocked during the exam. If you see these sort of questions, you are prepared for the for the exam as well. Okay. Fantastic. Any other? No. Okay. So let's go and and see something else. Oh, um. As I say, that, that, that now that the other chapter will start, by the way, so we are slowly going to the chapter three because uh, we, we have to solve some, um, this problem from a different perspective, from different picture, which is, which is solving the Laplace equation, essentially finding the boundary condition, the F function, which is satisfying the boundary condition. So, um, before, uh, uh, since I have only about half an hour before doing so, I would like to introduce you some important properties, which is spatial function. So, um, in, in, in mathematics and explicitly in electrodynamics, in, um, in quantum theory, in uh, quantum field theory, in quantum information, we deal a lot with expansions in terms of functions that we know, okay? So uh, it looks like this, this, this space that we are dealing with right now, for example, we are, we are let's say, living in the four-dimensional space or out. Of course, you can have time as well, which is also the, uh, another, another dimension that we do have or gravity or other things that we may have. So uh, if, if you assume that we are living in this space, then whatever happened to, uh, uh, to an object, it can be expressed in terms of those, uh, 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 let's say, 
uh, uh, vectors. So essentially in the three dimensional, we have three vectors, X hat, Y hat, and Z hat. And whatever it happens with the position, we will expand in terms of them, and then we will get the result. And then in visually, we can look at the independent component of them. Why we do that? Okay. Any thoughts? I mean, right now we have written this. R is equal to, I don't know, X, X hat plus Y, Y hat, Z, Z hat, or even cylindrical coordinate or spherical coordinate R, I don't know, um, sine of theta, cosine of phi, X hat, and others. Why we do this? It is easier to study the individual components. This is what, what Newton did essentially. And remember, sometimes by expanding the space, you may get the problem more complicated. You have to first look for the really the number of the vectors that you are needed to describe something. So for example, if your motion is along a line, the only parameter that you need is the distance from this point, okay, the origin. If the movement happens in a surface, then you need two parameters to define it. If it happens in the three-dimensional way, you need the three parameters. If you need time, also you have to add time or etc. So essentially what I want to tell you is that the number of parameters that you need depends on your space, vector space, and the need that you have. So, for example, we write, I, I don't know, R in terms of AI. EI. That can be any vector space. And EI can be I changing from one to N in N dimensional real space or even complex space is up to you. So that is in R power of N space. The same things happen even when you are dealing with analytical functions, okay? So for example, if you have, I don't know, sine of x, or I don't know, a, a logarithm of um, x power of two plus um, sine of x squared plus whatever. Any function that you do have also can be expanded in terms of specific functions because th those also can be your vector space, okay? So remember that also in analytical uh, calculus, we can define vectors to expand our, let's say, uh, uh, analytical functions in terms of them because it's easy to understand individual of, uh, let's say those functions uh, evolution or properties, okay? And that's really up to you. You can, you can define any, any orthogonal functions or other, other functions there. So you are familiar with Fourier expansions, right? Exactly, it's the same scenario. Fourier expansions, you have number of elements, which is number of vectors that you define in one dimensional uh, uh, real space, and then you expand any functions in terms of them. Why? Because individual of them, first of all, they're orthogonal. Second, all together, they are complete. Don't get fooled. The orthogonality is just a helpful element, is not a necessary one. What is important is they are complete bases. Okay? Who knows what is what are I mean Nazim, don't say that we, and Tarek as well because you are taking the course of uh, quantum information with, with quantum the theory of light with me, but the rest can you tell me what I mean by completeness? Does it have to do with every Cauchy sequence converges, or is that the wrong definition? Uh, is a wrong definition. <laughs> Maybe it's related, I don't know, but uh, can anyone tell me what, is, what I mean by, 
being complete. Does it mean That's that it. you can, oh, sorry, but <laughs> One of you go ahead, guys. Um, doesn't it mean that it's able to describe anywhere in that space? Uh, you are getting there, exactly. You are getting there, to, but I'm expecting something else in terms of answer. That's true. Any function can be expanded in terms of that. There is no other, there is no function that you cannot expand it. Okay? Are you, have you heard of coherent state, guys? Eat, eat it? Have you heard of coherent state, alpha? They are not orthogonal, but they are complete. It means that any function, folk states, whatever you have, you can expand in terms of coherent state. Those, they call them over complete bases. Means that they are not orthogonal, but still you can expand any function in terms of them. Let's go in, in, in languages. So as I say, uh, uh, assuming that you are moving in a, in a surface, right? How many independent vectors do you need? It's E1 and E2. Not more than that, all right? You can have E3, but that's too much. You can have even E4. That's even further too much because they, you don't need them really to discover that motion. Always the component to E3 and E4, they will be a constant value. But any motion that happens in this plane will be expanded. Any of motion of R in this plane will be given by, e, I don't know, R1, E1, plus R2, E2. This is what we are expecting. Okay. Now let's go back to the analytical functions. And that's the, the general picture. Essentially in analytical function also, we can have a set of U1X, U2X, U3X, and until UNX, By the way, let's go with n small because uh, because n can be mm, sorry. Let's go with n capital because n can be infinity. Not necessarily bounded. It can be infinite number of them. Not not explicitly linked. So we can define some properties for them. First of all, U1 until Un, they should be independent. Okay? Or that is what I'm considering to be orthogonal. So I assume that those functions, they are inde uh, independent. First of all, when you talk about analytical functions, you have to be explicit about the domain. What are, because we have functionality is function of X. What is X? It's changing from what to where. It's complex quantity, is a real quantity, is bounded quantity, is unbounded quantity. What are the limits? So for my case, for simplicity, I will consider that X is element of real. And moreover, X is bounded in the range of A and B. So essentially, this is a one dimensional space of X and I'm talking about only domain of A and B. Uh, sorry, the range of A and B, this range. Okay. You, one until you n, I will define an inner product for them. And I will call this inner product of u1 and u2 with this way, integral of u1 star u2. u2 of x. And another function here, which I will call it weight. This G is the weight. Of 
Aufgabe. Functions. When I say functions, special functions. Okay, you will see later on what I mean by the way. Oh, there is no star here, by the way. Okay. And let's go very general, not only for U1 and U2, let's go with UI and UJ, I and J is an arbitrary. And I will call them orthogonal functions when this is given by n, uh, no, not n, uh, I'm missing, uh, let's call it s, s of i delta of ij. So delta of ij is the delta Kronecker and SI is a function. Okay, so for example, the inner product of U1 and U1 is given by S1, U1 and U2 is given by zero, U1 and any U j is zero if j is not equal to one. So they are orthogonal to each other. By the way, this condition, as I said to you, it is not necessary, but uh, I mean, but let's start with this is a little bit simple. And we call this orthonormal, orthogonal and normal, if si is equal to one for any i. So for orthonormal function, normal set of function, what we have is ui uj, which is equal to ui star of x, uj of x, g of x, dx is equal to delta of ij. All right. The very important fact is that any function of f of x, or let's call it in capital way, f of x can be expanded in terms of u, u i of x a i i from one to n okay we call u i x complete basis whenever you can do that whenever you can write any function of x in terms of u i x, then we call these the complete base. So we call those complete bases. However, remember u i x, u j x, the inner product of them was delta of ij. It happens that fx still can be expanded in terms of ai vi of x 
but vi of x, vj of x is not equal to delta of ij. So they are not orthogonal to each other, but still you can do these expansions. We call these over complete basis. An example of these is a coherent state as we briefly discussed uh, uh, here. So for those people that they work in the uh, in a, uh, in a, uh, sp a spatial mode, which is which is a uh, uh, for light, um, I got the hypergeometric Gaussian modes as an as a over complete basis, which means that any function can be expanded in terms of them. Now let's go and let's go back and and see a few examples. I mean, I don't want to talk about the um, uh, the other conditions which um, those functions they have to have and what is the n that will will give you the, the permission to expand any functions in terms of them. Are they bounded? I, they are not bounded. So it's, 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 it's more complicated than, than simple, let's say, discussion. Uh, a part of my heart is, is look like a mathematician. I have to look at the deep uh, calculations. Uh, but uh, for you, uh, it's good that you will understand and you have a feeling about those special functions that we are going to use. So I don't want to bother you with proofs that you can you can prove that some set of functions, they are complete basis. Uh, it's not so trivial because you have to assume the series as, as a, Gavin mentioned briefly about the Cauchy condition. So sometimes you have you have to look at the difference between fx and the summation and square modulus and then you have to optimize it for any coefficient of ai so it means that you have to take the derivatives and see if whether they are complete or they are not complete anyway uh, we don't want to bother ourselves with this case let's go with simple situation assuming that we do have a domain which this domain for me is is from uh, from minus one to one, okay? So from minus one to one. This is the X domain that I have. So is X belonging to minus one and one? All right. What is the most trivial functions that you may get in, in calculus? Polynomials, right? Is the most trivial thing. So what are the polynomials? X power of zero, X power of one, X power of two, X power of three, and X power of n. All right? Use the above relation and find me a set of orthogonal functions based on this you get it so now i'm giving you the elements that you can build up orthogonal functions for me let's call it orthonormal make it normal as well sorry so those are the basis Vectors, I guess you can call them. And I'm giving you the ingredients, let's say, that which is they are one x, x2, x3, x power of four, and etc. And I'm telling you, are they orthogonal? No, they are not orthogonal. I can guarantee that they are not orthogonal. I'm telling you that find a way from those polynomials, so that they those x power of n, sorry, x power of n elements, find me a set of orthogonal functions, which the linear product between them is zero. And if you look at the linear product between each element is equal to one. Let me do the first step, okay? So the first function, which is u1, is equal to one, which is x power of zero, right? So u1x is equal to one, then what I will do, let's pick up the, the first element, which is u1 of x, which is x power of zero, and that is equal to one. 
All right. And now let's look at the orthognology, orthonormality. U1 and U1 should be equal to one. Okay. And uh, I say to myself that U1 of X, which is equal to one, is not really equal to one, it has a coefficient. So it's a coefficient of X zero, which is alpha for myself, okay? And I want to find alpha such a way that U1 times U1 is equal to identity. So here, then I will get integral of alpha square, absolute value, of course, because it's, uh, alpha can be an imaginary. So it will be alpha square minus one to plus one, dx equal to one. And from here, what I will get, I will get alpha square integral of one dx will be x from minus one to plus one is equal to one. What I will get from here, that will be equal to two alpha power of two is equal to one. And from here, alpha power of two is equal to one divided by two, and then alpha, it will be equal to one divided by square root of two. I don't care about plus and minus sign, okay? You can fix it. it, would, it even you can write it e power of i theta, it's up to you. Let's keep it for the time being as, as positive sign, okay? Beautiful, it is, you helped me <laughs> a lot. <laughs> okay, so that is u1, which we found it to be equal to one divided by square root of two. And you two, now the first choice that we do have is picking up the second function. The second element here is x power of one, right? Let's, this is wrong, by the way. I'm telling you this is wrong, but let's pick it up. So the first u, which I will write it with the red, just to indicate that this might be wrong one, is beta x. Okay, it's just a coefficient times the second polynomial, which is x power of one. Now, what is the property of this? Definitely that should be uh, uh, normalized to one. Let's do the calculation and you will get beta power of two, x power of two, then after the integral, it will be x power of three, then it's fine. There is absolutely not a problem, but u2 and u1, they should be orthogonal to each other. Let's do the calculation for that. So in then u1 and u2, or u2, u1, should be equal to zero. Let's check it out. So it will be integral from minus one to plus one of u1, which is one divided by square root of two, and u2 is beta x. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. Of dx. And if you do the mathematics, it will be one divided by square root of two of beta x power of two, all right? Divided by two from minus one to plus one. What is the value? That is zero. Okay, good. So even that is simple. Sorry, I was, I was mistaken. <laughs> So then let's look and find out what is the beta. So u2 and u2 should be equal to one. Then therefore integral of minus one and plus one of u2, which is beta x power, x power of two, dx, which is equal to beta power of two, x power of three divided by three from minus one to plus one. And that should be equal to one, which is with beta power of two, two divided by three, it should be equal to one. And from here, what I will get, beta is equal to uh, square root of two, two divided by three. So u2 of x is equal to square root of two divided by three of x. Sorry. So is, it even it's what, is it three over two? Yes, three over two. Thank you. Merci. Three over two. I think I'm tired. Need coffee. Three divided by two. Excellent. Fantastic. So U1 and U2, they are, we got them. 
And now about U3, let's see. Then I think the U3 will get a problem. U3 of X, we assume that is gamma X power of two. Let's see if that satisfies the condition that we do have or not. So first of all, U3, U3 should be equal to one. Then integral of gamma power of two, x power of four, dx from minus one to plus one should be equal to one. That is gamma power of two of x power of five divided by five, uh, that it should be equal to one. And then we will get here uh, gamma equal to square root of five divided by two. All right. What is happening with orthogonality? So let's check it out. If u3 and u1 is equal to zero, that's the check. So u3 and u1, that will be integral of u3, which is gamma x power of two, u1, which is one divided by square root of two, of dx from minus one to plus one. And that is equal to one divided, gamma divided by square root of two, integral of x power of three from minus one to plus one, dx equal to, uh, uh, sorry. That is x power of three from minus one to plus one, which is square root of two of gamma. Do you agree? There is also a over three, one over three, I think coefficient there somewhere. Which, where? Like x to the power of three over three. Oh, yes, yes, it is three. Yes, thank you. And then let's check u3 and u2. Check it out if that is equal to zero. That will be integral of gamma x power of two. And then u2 is beta, which is uh, square root of three divided by two of x dx. And that is gamma square root of three divided by two. And that will be um, x power of three, x power of four from minus one to one divided by, sorry, four, and that is equal to zero, All right? So U1 and U3, they are not orthogonal, but U2 and U3, they are orthogonal. Now we do have a problem. So U1 is built, U2 is built, but U3, no. So what we have to do then, we go back and we look at the we look at the, uh, the let's say the coefficients that we can add it here such a way that the orthogonality still will remain. So what you need to do is you define a u tree of x such a way that is given by let's say delta uh, one, which is x power of zero plus gamma x power of two. And with this way, first of all, you find the orthogonality. If they are orthogonal to each other, you will find the condition for uh, delta and gamma. And from the other side also, you have to look for the relationship between alpha and gamma, such a way that they are uh, normal to one. And from this, you will find out that uh, uh, the delta exists and also gamma exists. Okay, so this is the way that people, they built up this. We will follow uh, up on this uh, next lecture. It's a little bit later and I am a little bit tired and doing mistakes. So I do want to mess up further. And uh, we will follow up on this uh, next lecture uh, with, uh, with a couple of other examples. And uh, finally, we will solve uh, a Laplace equation for specific cases. So I will stop the video. Any question, guys? No questions? I will stop the video.